Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers living in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Oh, yeah. I can't resist doing a noise after. I, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, I also, since we switched it up, since I'm like ha- have the last word now, I always feel like I have to say something after mm. you. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but I always occupy it with a noise. Yeah, you even keep you keep going with it. I'm sorry. Um, it's a little. It's we got a little early morning record. Yeah, it is six a.m. here in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, the red eye edition. No, I'm just kidding. No, we are we are recording pretty early. I just drank coffee. I'm yes. shaking. Um, as you can see, uh, if you're watching the YouTube, I'm wearing a hat, which means that I have not showered today. <laughs> and uh, so if we if we sound a little woke today, that's because we just woke up. <laughs> Is that an original joke? Yeah, I was thinking about it this morning. Dang, man. <laughs> I knew you liked that one, James. That's good. It's got that dad vibe to it. Oh, man. such So dad. How you been, though? I've been good. Been working. Been living. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, one thing that I need to update everybody on is the end of the no Instagram month. Has it really been a month since I, you've been off? I think it has been at this point. And let me tell you, I feel wonderful. Really? Wow. Okay. Uh. No, no urges to get on the phone for any reason other than to change the music. Um, no thinking about what's going on in this alternate reality that's not our own. That is, that is some sort of virtual plane on which we all, uh, you know, flex on each other. Uh, I, uh, I feel, I feel all right. I mean, I, I, I will say that I have been obviously checking out Instagram through my iPad right. at least once a day. Okay. But just mostly checking up on the people that matter. Am I in those people? Oh, you're you're uh, close to the top of the close, list. Close, <laughs> close. I almost made the cut. I mean, my wife posted something last week. So. Okay, well, your wife is definitely more important than me. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, but that's a once in a blue moon kind of occasion. So you you know you got to watch out for those those posts from the wife. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, Do you have post alerts turned on? It's hilarious. Last year she was putting it together top nine, and I think she only had posted eight photos <laughs> the entire year. So what happened? Uh, what did top nine do? <laughs> <laughs> Does that break the system? Or maybe she maybe she posted ten, and she uh, oh, that okay. was. But let me tell you, that was a difficult decision. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're we're not really on Instagram either one of us very much. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I I don't know. It's uh, it's hard to think about coming back. Um, I really want. I'm I really you, want to wipe all of the people. Like I really want to wipe my who I'm following. Well, yeah. See, that's the, that's the difference between you and I because you follow what two thousand or something. Like that? One thousand something. Yeah. The just the massive amount of people that you follow yeah. means that it's not as curated. But but you have a curated follower list, and then you end up looking at all of their posts. yes we well we have different uh, you know different instagram practices and my yeah. practices is definitely different but uh yeah. i don't know i'll probably end up coming back because i have some things that i want to start posting about and announcing some other projects in the works that i can't really say too much about right now but well i i think i think that's good because i don't know I think that's like the best of both worlds right yeah you you're not addicted to it and you still get to share the important things in your life the problem is, is that once you post something, then you're interested in how that post is doing, and that's how it reels you back in because you're you're trying to check out that slot machine and see mm-hmm. like, gotta get oh, that man. dopamine hit. Yeah, because you're it's always like the first the first hour you're like really glued to it, mm, and yeah, then yeah. like past that, like if a post isn't doing well, you're always checking back to see like. Oh, maybe maybe the rush is coming in a couple hours, and it never comes. No, it's always the first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can definitely tell like if a post is going to do well in the first yeah. first half hour for sure. But uh, something that I will be posting about soon is that one of my designs that I've done for one of the companies that I've worked for. I'm being very vague here because I can't say too much about it, but it did win a well known industrial design award whoa congrats so, brother yeah confetti. all that vagueness can you put, can you put confetti down on this? <laughs> i i can i have before i'm just giving you hard work today uh, <laughs> editing <yeah>. work <laughs> but uh but yeah it's pretty exciting that's I mean, awesome man you know it it's not it's one of those things where the work that i do i'm not even i haven't even really thought about awards in a long time because the first company that i worked for kind of refused to submit products for the awards. Oh, that's not good. And then um, 
you know, since then, it, it just hasn't been in my mind. But mm-hmm. one of the companies that I worked for, you know, they just did a big launch. So they wanted to submit all the great work that was done, uh, you know, so that that work and the and the designers could get recognition for, for you know, what what they accomplished yeah that's awesome man i i think you know in talking about that other company i I didn't quite understand it because i think that any time that like you can kind of your give your employees your design employees a boost of wow like the work that i'm doing is getting recognized i i think that's good yeah that's that's good for employee morale and for sure yeah i i that's kind of weird that they did that i actually that's one of the things i need to do like this weekend I'm. Uh, I need to submit some of the products I did for Petmate mm. uh, that were that released last year because I think it's last year's turn to submit or something. I don't. Yeah. Know. But um. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. I mean, that I'm super thankful. Like Petmate's like, oh yeah, yeah. Submit. I mean, you don't even work here anymore, but please, you know, we'll pay for it. Do you know which ones you're going to submit to? Uh, I definitely want to submit to Core. Um, that's like that'd be my dream is to get a Core seventy seven award. Mm. Um. And then uh, D-Zine, I think, has some awards. Hmm. Uh, Fast Company. I like the blog awards. Um, you're not you're not so much for the uh, the IDEA or the uh, the red dots. Uh, I mean, those are good too. I think um, I think some of those can be a little pay to play. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think I like the smaller guys because it seems a little bit more like like I don't know in the family yeah i did see that on the idea panel is one of our uh interviewees michael detulo oh he's on there? he's on he's oh, that's on that cool. panel okay um so yeah that's that's pretty cool that's cool i i i don't know how they like how they go about i was looking through the you know the who's on that panel i mean idea is that that's ideos it, no isn't is it idsa I mean? awards oh gosh I'm, i don't know i'm pretty sure um, I'm pretty sure IDEA is IDSA. Um, yeah, but yeah, dude, that's awesome. I'm glad that you got a, got an award. I'm excited to hear more about it. You have to share it, share yes. with what you got. Yes. Everything. When I can share more than just generalities and, you know, abstractions. Wait, so wait, just to correct, was IDEA award? IDEA I- is an IDSA got it. award. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Nick, what's been going on with you this week? Oh man, it's been a busy week for me. Yeah. Um, I just moved out of the studio, so that's, you know, bittersweet, Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, moving on up. Um, I don't get to move into the new studio until, like, later this month, maybe until April 1st. Uh, They're still, like, renovating parts of it, but I had to move all my stuff back into my room. (laughs) So, (laughs) if you're watching the YouTube, you might have noticed, like, things have changed a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, behind the camera is just piles and piles of boxes stacked to the ceiling. Oh my, gosh. my 3d printer is on my bed and, uh, you know, it's, it'll yeah. work. It, it, <laughs> there's, there's like 12 dogs in cages and no, I don't know how no. Nick has trained them to be so silent, but clearly these are test animals. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> I'm not talking about like, you know, like me- medically, you know, you're obviously testing dog toys oh, and right, you've right, taken right. in a few strays, but they're amazingly quiet. Yeah. They're very cute. Yeah. <laughs> He um, lets him out to play like <laughs> once a week, guys. Jeez. Oh man. Uh, but yeah. So I, I was moving this week. I also recently uh, pushed out my sponsor project from Microsoft. Nice. Um, yeah. So yeah. Saw that. I, I did see that. Yeah. Thank, oh yeah. Thanks. I got on the Instagram just for that. Um, so that was interesting. I I think. Uh, I mean, first of all, like, super thankful, like being sponsored by anyone like that's awesome like yeah to get to that level so i was excited to, to work on this project with microsoft um it was definitely a it's definitely one of the larger sponsored projects i've ever done and also uh definitely more, more challenging than i expected mm. um you know i think the the project for those who hadn't seen it yet uh, microsoft reached out and wanted to collaborate and promote some of their uh inking technologies mm-hmm. in their powerpoint yeah and, and other software um and so they have some like sketching annotating tools um and so i you know it's obviously powerpoint's not a sketching program right um so i definitely wanted to frame the collaboration in the sense of like you know what like what's the best way to promote this kind of technology Mm -hmm. and so i created kind of this like 
you know, tutorial series on my stories of how I present my concepts yeah. to my clients. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I thought it was definitely, I, I think the stories worked really well. I think people reached out and were like, oh yeah, this is good. Like I, we need to see this, like, this is like the level of fidelity that we need to present our clients with and like right. annotating things and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is kind of interesting because I don't know of any other pre- like presentation specific tool that allows you to do annotation within it and is like sort of enabled in this way. Like certainly not Google Slides or InDesign. I right. mean, InDesign, you could get out like the, the pencil tool, but that's kind of weird getting into that. Because are these lines, when you create them, are they like vectorized like spline lines or are they more um, rasterized? I think they're rasterized. Yeah. Um, and if you don't know the difference between, should we educate on vector versus raster? That Well, ra- raster is like pixels. Think yes. Of, think, of, think of pixels. And then vector is like, think of your old T83 calculator, putting in like, ve- uh, like you know, parabolas and things like that that's like that's what that's, that's where you go yeah that's what were we gonna say you're it's like a harvard class <laughs> i i'm saying it's the difference between photoshop and illustrator but my mom doesn't know what photoshop and illustrator oh are. man yes i suppose we need to run the master class um, um but uh but yeah, but yeah i think uh you know i definitely i definitely got a lot of support people were like congrats on the sponsorship you know congrats i think this is good that you're sharing um you know sharing these like and this is something we'll talk about a little later in this episode, but, you know, sharing the parts of design that don't get talked about a lot. You yeah. Know, like how to present to your clients and things like that. The uh, not so glamorous looking right. parts. Um, so, yeah, I, I appreciate everyone's support. I think it was also tough just because, especially on Instagram, it's very visual. So people don't necessarily read the caption. Right. And so there was definitely people that might have been misled about about like nick why are you sketching in powerpoint or like <laughs> or like what software is this i thought yeah. you used an ipad yeah and so like that was a little tough but yeah i don't know it's you, you can't help it's just like how things go yeah i th- i think it's interesting i mean you know you know me i'm i'm over rendering on my phone so i think that becoming aware of how you can utilize these different programs because you might be you might be in an office where they're paying for my you know the office suite and you're like as a designer you're like how how am i going to use this i'm an indesign i've been using indesign my entire life right and and a lot of times it's like you have to use powerpoint yeah like no one like you can't go into meeting like trying to pull up a pdf because it's the entire company is not pdf (laughs) pdf literate the company's one server will explode (laughs) Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was, it was, I mean, certainly thankful for it. Uh, and you know, like keep trying. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, moving on, moving on, uh, the, uh, that we have a new segment called minor, minor details. Oh yeah. Because I was, <laughs> you know, I was on the old noosh the other day, lemon the design and, blog, um, you know, not to call out because I love I love the work of Layer, mm-hmm. um, but I was I was looking at this image. Now, if you're not watching the YouTube, and you should be, um, James, no, you, don't 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 exclude parts of our audience. Man. <laughs> you there, tube. Um, but um, yeah, so. I was looking at this image and there's this there's this thing about this image that if you're aware of it, it drives you insane. And if you're not, I'm, we're about to make you aware of this thing right, that okay. will then drive you insane. Yes. And what we're looking at right now is a power adapter with a USB coming out of it. Uh, designed by Layer, you said? Uh, I believe so. For Noli. Yes. Um, just plugged into the wall. Yeah. Um, yeah, continue. James. And the the uh, the power adapter is it's kind of like it's kind of the same form that the that the AirPod has in a way. It's kind of that that similar sort of rounded rounded rectangle, you know, profile with then filleted edges. So kind of like a curved uh, curved edge uh, rectilinear form, right? Similar um, to the AirPods case. 
and I have to I have to shout out somebody, the person who educated this to uh, this phenomenon to me in the first place, who was Gabe Rueg. Uh, I worked with at Lifetime Brands, and he showed me this this thing, which is in with uh, fillets and with curves in general. There are things called curvature continuous fillets, and yes. then there's just circular fillets. And I don't know how this surface was made, but to me, it comes across as something that was made using circular fillets versus curvature continuous. Right. Because as you can see, there's there's sort of if you're watching the YouTube and Nick is going to <laughs> going to explain yeah, yeah, yeah. more aud- auditor auditorially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's this line. There's this clear line between the flat face of this rectilinear form and where it starts to curve. Right. Um, and that's sort of that's the what happens when you do a circular fillet. Right. So yeah, you showed me this today, and I I realize now what you're talking about. Um, you know, it's it looks similar to the AirPods case, but if you look at the AirPods case, I don't have yeah. my AirPods on with me. But and I'll pull I'll pull up the AirPods case. It, it really it kind of like dances in the light, mm-hmm. and curvature continuous is is something that can really you really see when the reflections hit it. Um, definitely in car design and you know very surface heavy designs like the designers are very focused on like how the light plays and how it kind of transforms over the surfaces. Yeah. Um, and to give kind of an example, like this is how I was thinking about it. If you're think about driving a, a, a car on a racetrack, right? Mm. You're, you're going down just on a straight road and then all of a sudden there's a 90 degree turn, right? Mm. So y- you wouldn't drive the car straight down the road and then, once you get to the turn, just turn your wheel and go like 90 degrees. Yeah. You would like slowly drift over to the left side of the track mm-hmm. and then turn right. to, to the right. Right. And kind of get like this nice sweeping smooth turn. Yeah. Right? Like that's how you race. That's like the most efficient way. Yeah. And so there's not like a jolt of a turn. Right. And so that's the difference between curvature continuous and uh, just circular fillets. Right. So Cir- there's... Circular is just like 90 degrees jolting. Yeah. Curvature continuous is like kind of dips down a little bit and then curves around. Yeah. And right before the podcast, I kind of made this this image to, to kind of further illustrate. Uh, so again, on the YouTube, you'll be able to see this. And so the top one is the curvature continuous and the bottom is the circular fillet. And if you look closely on the circular fillet, you can see that jolt where the flat face meets the start of the fillet versus on the top one where you don't perceive where the flat face ends and the and the curvature uh, continuous fillet begins. It's nice and smooth. Ooh. It, it's 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 one of those again, minor, minor details. Yes. That is is very hard to communicate via audio, but um, definitely research curvature continuous. There's curvature continuous fillets in SolidWorks and on shape. That's the programs we use. Yeah. I don't know. Hey, there's probably curvature continuous in Fusion 360. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that uh, this is a, another thing that I wonder sometimes is is how much, you know, if you're working with a particular factory, if they are like, because a lot of times factories are rebuilding CAD. And and this is an important thing. Yes. Yeah. Because th- this is the thing that I get so upset. I've <laughs> This is a conversation I have <laughs> Oh, Nick's getting fired up. Um <laughs> Um, yeah, I've, I've been in the situation where it's like, oh, I'm sending my designs over to the factory. Um, and the factory reproduces those designs without the curvature continuous fillets in the surfaces. And it's frustrating because it's like, I mean, it even just happened to the, the bottle opener that, that I'm working on Yeah, where, you know, like I, I had a curvature continuous fillet in there and they just changed it to a circular and it just was like a jolt. Oh. And I was I was frustrated because it's like please use my cat right please use the drawings I provided, um, and it and it and a lot of times they do like I've been like at Petmate, um, literally like they just cut tools with my cat which was crazy, <laughs> <laughs> definitely made mis- some mistakes that way yeah <laughs> but also awesome because like the curvature continuous was there I one of my recent posts uh, maybe it was like. A month ago or so, I I uh, rendered out my cat 
a, a wand toy. Mm. I don't know if you remember that one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was like purple. Um, and you know, really crazy for Jackson Galaxy. And that had curvature continuous on everything. And, you know, it was just, it turned out really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good little minor, minor detail. Yeah, it's segment. one of those things that like, in the end, it might not make or break a design, but it's one of those things. It's like the FedEx logo with the arrow. It's one of those things yeah, yeah. that once you see it, you can never unsee it. If you If you aren't aware, there is an arrow between the E and the X <gasps> of FedEx. Have you never seen this no, before? I'm just kidding. Come I'm just, on! I'm kidding. I've seen it. Oh. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think yeah, you're right. It's it's like one of those details that just takes your design up a hair. Like, yes, just enough to like make it even a better design. Yeah, and that's why if you look at the job boards, a lot of times Apple is hiring people only for 3D modeling. Yeah, like. Only for that. I mean, these are people that are paying attention to those kind of details. Right. Hired to do so. Um, I, yeah. But yeah, we wanted to dive into our topic this week. I guess kind of bouncing off of the the sponsored project and everything. And, uh, you know, there's the, the idea of... We post a lot of things on the internet. We post a lot of our design work. And how much of the design process should we be showing mm. online or even on Instagram... You know, and, and I know that there's been some recent posts on like the Instagram bubble, right? Of you know, what is the proper way to sketch? Like, what should you be posting? Right, things like that. Because because the idea is, are we misleading, especially students, about what professional industrial design looks like? Mm-hmm. And so, for instance, you know, Tony uh, Tony Elkington. He posted this thing. I guess he gave a talk to some students uh, about Instagram lies. Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he does point out that a lot of the stuff that we are showing on Instagram are are things that are not necessarily being used in our professional lives. Like the brown, for instance, the brown paper sketching. Like that's... That's one of the things that a lot of people call out as like, this is something that nobody ever does in Instagram. Right. Or or nobody ever does professionally. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting. We just got off talking to Sam Does Design on on his live stream and he brought it up. And um, I don't know what you think about this, Nick, but but one of the things that he brought up is, is this idea that it appeals to a wider audience. And... Right. So to me, <laughs> brown paper sketching is like the marijuana of industrial design. <laughs> it is the gateway drug into industrial design. That's true. And um, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. Like I think that uh, yeah. creating awareness around product design and the beauty of product and uh, yeah, bringing people in is not a not a bad thing. And I, I definitely, I think this this week's topic is definitely going to be more niche because it is very focused on kind of the Instagram community in terms of posting these design sketches. And and yeah, and by these brown paper sketches, we're talking about right. more illustrative, more like marker rendering. You know, I also think a lot of digital rendering is similar to in similar effect where it's like just the flashy eye candy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think I think in general, like. You know, I've always loved posting the the process on my Instagram. Like, that's how I've always done it. Just like, you know, maybe one day I'm posting doodles. Maybe one day I'm posting a digital sketch. Maybe one day I'm posting a render or mm-hmm. paper models. I I love mixing it up. Right. Um, just because I guess I would get bored if I did the <laughs> same thing over and over. Um, and you found good success with doing that. Yeah, because, again, I, it's interesting how you mentioned the the wider audience thing. And I think we've talked about this before, but, you know, my thought is, like, if you are going to stay within, like, if you want to grow an Instagram, you have to reach a broader audience of, like, whether that's architecture or illustration or right. s- or something like that. If you want to, like, break out above, like, 30,000. Right. Like, because I, I only think there's probably about 30,000 industrial design people on Instagram. <laughs> that, that's my thought. Or, like, people that enjoy industrial right. design. Right. Um, 
if you go out beyond that, you're reaching into like people who like illustration, people who like building things or yeah. architects or, yeah. or maybe you just like have a bunch of bots. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, the one thing that I can point to of yours that I would say is somewhat equivalent to the reach of a brown paper sketch is kind of your more humorous chair sketches. Right. Because those are definitely like just fun. Yeah. And so there are these mechanisms of of reaching a wider audience. But the thing is, is that once you've reached the wider audience, you can then sort of begin this, I guess, education process Mm -hmm. or like this is sort of the nitty gritty into these things. And um, and so I don't know. I mean, I yeah, I think. Well, I think there's I think recently, um, especially with the instagram changes with i guess the you know the algorithm just the the social media ecosphere in general has been changing i would say definitely in the past year um it started to affect people you know definitely i mean even me you know it affects me um and you know because of this people are wondering like you know oh my doodle sketches aren't getting as much many likes as my mm. digital sketches mm. and so like that plays with your head you know so instagram is kind of encouraging the wrong the wrong things yeah and and obviously you know people want that dopamine hit so they're gonna post the digital, yeah. digital sketches or the, the the marker renderings um you know which which is kind of exacerbated the, the the whole idea i i also think that there's a little bit of a I don't know, shame game going on mm. in a way. I mean, this is like super in the in the weeds in the weeds of Instagram. So I know this is not super broad, but um, you know, I don't think it's bad. Like you're saying to like post a digital sketch or yeah. p- or post a marker rendering. It's fun. Like we, yeah. we enjoy doing it, right? Um, and so I don't want to like say that that's bad or right. Or, I don't know. Yeah, and and the the other side of that is a lot of these. I think there could be a criticism of doing that, those kind of sketches and that, yes, they're not used professionally. And yes, like they're far more time consuming than your job would ever allow for. Right. But the thing is, is that, and, and there's, there's probably a really great analogy for this. And Nick, I'm going to have to ask you to analogize this <laughs> okay. because you're the analogy king right now. Um, but I think that there's something about like, doing doing the the thing that is the hardest thing to do like a really beautiful tonal paper sketch right. is probably one of the hardest techniques to execute and to execute well but once you've learned how to do that all of your other sketching skills are also improved in that process mm, for sure you know there sure. is a there is a trickle down effect yeah. from from doing those harder techniques yeah i that it, that is true like just because you know that's the only technique that you like doing it yeah like i i agree with you um because you always bring up the picasso analogy of like when he was younger his paintings were his, amazing yeah very realistic but you know at some point that starts to become dull for him yeah. and he's looking to express himself in different ways and his sketches later in life, his like quick doodles are some of the most gorgeous drawings <laughs> I've ever seen. And that's from a lifetime of of constantly reaching like both in his physical artistic practice and also just his methodology and his thinking around the work that he's creating. Like he's always he's always challenging himself. And then when it comes to like executing something like you know, very small, like a doodle. It's, it's masterful yeah. because he's stretched his limits right in all, in all directions. No, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if I have an analogy for that, but like, I, <laughs> I, I definitely, I definitely agree. Um, I also feel like, you know, in, in general, I think I, I want to give people more credit than, mm. than like, I, I, like, I don't think, Maybe maybe I'm crazy, but I don't think that there's students, like design students, sitting there, scrolling through Instagram and being like, "Oh, look at these beautiful illustrations." Mm. That's how you design, right? I, I I really hope 
that people are smarter and are able to critically think and, and realize like, oh, that's not all of design. Like yeah. that's part of design. Yeah. Or maybe that's just a fun aspect of design. Right. There's many other aspects of design. And and I would hope that if you are in design school, that's obviously, uh, that should be an obvious yeah. thing to you. Yeah. I can see that like maybe if you're a high school student interested in design, you can see like, oh, whoa, people just get to sketch products. Yeah. And you might be, I can see that that could be slightly misleading. Mm. But I also would hope that like, it's the internet. Right. Like if that's, if you're just like looking at these beautiful sketch renders and thinking, oh, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. You should definitely have done some research. You know, like, <laughs> like I, there should be some buyer beware. Right. In this conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think right now we are at this point where we're aware of the comparative nature of Instagram and all these social media platforms and the detrimental effects that it can have on people. But I think that, you know, I think that maybe there's some responsibility on the professors. You know, I, I know that, you know, a professor like Derek Cassio, like he is, he knows the platform. He knows mm. how his students are interacting with it. And he knows how to talk to them about like what it is and what it's good for and like where it, where it's not reflective of the practice of industrial design. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been trying to advocate for for a long time, and there was a live stream with uh, Spencer Nugent where I asked this question, where it's like, to me, I want Instagram to be the place where I can explore the things that I can't explore at my job because, you know, it's just not, it's just not a part of the uh, the process that I would ever do yeah, within you, my job. You want to have the fun, crazy stuff. Yeah. And I think that there needs to be this clear delineation that Instagram is for fun and Behance is for, is for representing your work. That's an interesting solution. You know? Huh. So I, that to me is kind of like the clear distinction that I would like to make and that I think needs to be made because it like... I, I don't understand accounts that are just showing their professional work, like profession, you know, like here's another project that I did. Here's another project. And that's all they show. Yeah. And it's like, to me, I'm really interested. Like one of the reasons I became interested in, in your work and, and there's other Instagrammers out there like this who are showing kind of like the behind the scenes stuff of right. like these side projects that they're doing. Like that's compelling to me in, in, in the Instagram world. So I don't know. That's that's kind of my thing is Instagram is for fun. Behance is for work. I like that. I like that. <clears throat> what about, so, I mean, I guess kind of broadening it out, like you're, you're talking about with Behance and stuff, like in general, like how, how much of the process should we be showing? Because mm. I even think about people, uh, designers on, on the, on the internet, like posting on their website, um, where they're not even posting sketches. Mm. They're just posting the final product. Right. Right. Yeah, I I don't know. I think there are certain projects that I do where I'm like, I don't know if I can even show all the other stuff because I don't even know if the company would want me showing everything else. Like showing all the sketches. Yeah, because... Because there's also like maybe good sketches that could be reused in there. right and they're good ideas that could be reused and and who knows who's looking at those ideas and you know a lot of people have their password protected portfolio websites right. and things like that i think like there are just some parts of the process that n nobody's necessarily going to be interested in unless it's as a part of a narrative you know if you're just showing like the like a really or or even any like minor really you know like a meeting that you had like if you're showing like just a picture of a discussion yeah that's obviously not going to take you anywhere on instagram um oh yeah i get yeah definitely if you post like that kind of stuff yeah but i think like I like seeing the nitty gritty stuff sort of in a gallery telling a story to then get to something a bit more polished. Mm. Like, I think that is compelling sort of like storytelling. I look at like, you know, I look at like Jasper Morrison or like, mm. like the, you know, the famous designers. And 
I don't know. I, I wonder if I should like take all the sketches off my website hmm. and like all the process and just put the final product. Right. I mean, I, I'm not going to do that now for sure. Like that's not like, I'm just like, and I'm thinking like 10 years in the future. Like what, what is it going to look like? What's my, design, right. what's my website going to, you know, I don't know. And why would you do that? Just because they're doing it. <laughs> but why do you think they're doing it and why is it compelling to you to Look do at that? Me. I'm I'm the exact problem. Like Do you just do you I, just I just want... see things on the internet and I copy them? <laughs> <laughs> um I I don't know what it is or why it's so compelling that to just post the final product. Mm-hmm. I think it just feels very it feels more professional because you aren't showing that like nitty gritty, that mm. rough stuff. Mm. And so it just looks a lot more polished. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. And maybe maybe that kind of plays into that what you're saying is like Instagram's for the experimenting and Behance or websites is for the polished work. Right. Also also I'm thinking about I guess there's a difference here because the the website of Jasper Morrison or the famous designers or like, you know, those those websites are for clients mm. clients are coming to those websites looking for product design right and so do they necessarily care about sketches probably not they want a good product that's going to sell well mm-hmm. um whereas if if i want to get hired at frog or at smart design right sketches are important there right because they're looking for designers who can sketch well communicate their ideas think yeah think critically there so is... i think there is this distinction there that that is important yeah there are different audiences obviously but you never know, like you could be working for a corporate client and they have to answer to somebody else above them. And in order to feel comfortable hiring somebody, they want to see that you have the skills to show, like to showcase ideas in a way that's that justifies the work that you're doing <laughs> for the for the company, like to show the sketches, to show the research, like they want because they're going to have to answer to somebody else right. above them perhaps and they want to be able to hand them a packet of like here's the development so far as like yeah. a representation of the work i feel like this is starting yeah like this this starts to dive into this thing that i've been thinking about a lot recently mm. which is like honestly like it doesn't like it doesn't design doesn't even matter <laughs> oh no oh. have you been like Oh my God, you're sinking into nihilism. What happened to the I'm optimistic spir- robot I'm, I used to know? I'm spiraling down. I'm spiraling no. Down. Um, no, what I mean by that is I, I've touched on it a few times and I've been trying to articulate it better, but yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to articulate, but essentially what matters is the core idea, the core concept mm-hmm. of the product. Like the whole idea of like, should this fill it be five millimeters or 10 millimeters? I mean, sure, that's important, but it's just, it doesn't matter. Mm. Like, it, it it doesn't matter whether, you know, whatever, I don't know, like my toaster has five millimeters or 10 millimeters because the concept is is that it makes toast mm. in a way, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm just thinking very conceptually and that's because that's cause I enjoy that kind, of, that kind of process of like, how far can I push this product design? Like, you know, I think about all of my products that, that I, I like to do on the side and like mm-hmm. very like try to push the idea, push it conceptually. Yeah. Um, you know, like the Ben mirror or, or whatever it is. It's just, it's not about the actual geometry of it. It's like taking away all the geometry just so it leaves the concept. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just, so a, a reductive methodology in a way, I think. Yeah. I know. I don't even know if that's related to the conversation. I just like, <laughs> hey man, this is for getting out those thoughts. This is you this know? is this is a uh, this is our morning woke. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to morning woke. Oh god, that'd be terrible. Um, but uh, one maybe maybe one final thing yeah. that I'll say okay. to to perhaps wrap this all up. The in defense of showing the the nitty gritty, um, and especially to students. Um, I remember young James Connors, maybe middle school age. I used to go to Barnes and Noble with my mom all the time. She would go there to buy books and I would always go to like the, the graphic novel section. Yeah. Like I would, I would run there sprint. 
um, often knocking people over, <laughs> causing all sorts of concussions. But no. um, what I would be beelining for was this Batman animated series, like concept art book, basically. Hmm. It was kind of behind the scenes. And I don't know if anybody remembers, if you have never seen the uh, Bruce Tim Batman animated series, uh, it is it is a must watch. Like this this show revolutionized how that they were doing the animated superhero shows, um, like for TV, and it's it's just like it's such a good show. It's like kind of dark, but it's just awesomely Batman. But anyway, I, I remember looking at this book because it would show all of these behind the scene scene sketches and doodles and things. And what it did was for like little James Connors, it made me realize that everything has to start somewhere because like there is sort of this intimidation factor for for things like this where you're like, I, how did how did anybody make this show? Like, how does the show even get done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, it, it can seem like daunting hmm. that you could be able to do anything to this to this scale. And then you see all these little doodles and all this development that was done to like in preparation for all of this. Right. And it humanizes the creators and makes them seem more, more reachable. Um, And yeah, I mean, I think it's an important conversation for the community to have. And I'm glad that the community is having these conversations. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's definitely important to, to think about this. I, I do, I I do want to push for more positivity. I feel like, the conversation is definitely a little bit negative mm-hmm. in the way of like, oh, I feel bad or like, oh, I shouldn't have posted the the fancy render because now, now I'm deceiving. You. Like, guys, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to post that stuff. Right. Like, do it. Be positive about it. Be like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. We're excited about this. You know, and then just add in some some more of those, those minor details. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I agree. I think, I don't know how much we really made headway on this conversation. I, I don't know. It's a, conversation, it's a conversation, and we would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. So leave Discord. us. Hey, hey, forgot to mention Discord. Yeah, leave messages in the, on the YouTube or on the Instagram or get in the Discord because yeah. I mean, and I don't want to be, sound like I'm I'm bolstering something that you know, like we created, but. I am loving the Discord because I feel like this is the real place for the conversation to be happening. No, it's been good. Because like... It's the thing we've been looking for. Since, convers- yeah. It's the thing we've been looking for since episode one. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Conversations on Instagram are awkward and weird because it's like you're having a conversation on somebody's post. Yeah. Whereas on the Discord, it is a running conversation and it's it's really awesome. Like I love seeing what people are saying and there's a lot of interesting thoughts and opinions right going up on the discord and and you can find the link if you haven't joined yet on our instagram account um or on the minor details podcast.com yeah do it um and i think it's time to get some some questions it's time for questions it's question time all right so we had a question come in from matt b white and matt b white asks can you speak to your experience oh we had no voicemails not a single voicemail. Guys, really, people? Guys, you have voices. Yeah. If you want to send in a voicemail, our number is 1-646-494-4011. Did you really have to look that up? Uh, it's so easy to remember. I, well, yeah. I, 1-646-494-4011. Um, send in voicemails because odds are you're going to get played. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Back back to Matt. Matt's question, though. Um He says, can you speak to your experience of freelancing and adapting to company culture during your short-term projects, both in terms of on-site and remote projects, um, and things to potentially address, tactics for adapting fast, their project management styles or lack thereof, setting up your space slash feeling comfortable, Hmm. which is interesting because it's definitely a thing that we've never talked about before. Yeah. Here's my outside the box <laughs> all right i'm ready to hear it <laughs> you ready for this mm-hmm. um i would say that you need to get out there and date more <laughs> what yeah go on more first dates because that's a way that you adapt to new situations really quickly oh huh or go speed dating that's interesting 
Um, it's interesting. I mean, any any place that you're put in a situation where you have to meet a lot of people at once, I mean, just learning the adaptive nature of just like, okay, this is the situation I'm in and this is how I'm going to run with it. I mean, creating good connections, like when you walk into a new company, it's, it's sometimes difficult and sometimes takes a while, but um, you got to be adaptive. That's, that's kind of like the crux of being a freelancer is that adaptivity. Yeah. I think that is, that is the key part, like uh, adapting to the situation I don't know if there's good ways to do that except for just head first, you know? Yeah. Head first into love. <laughs> I don't know that my advice is any good, but but that's... I, I remember back in my single days, I, I once, many, many years ago, ago, many moons ago, I set up four first dates in one week. And I it was like to overcome my fear of first dates. And it worked. Huh. I mean putting yourself out there and meeting people it's you know it's uh it's something that's difficult at first but you can get used to it just like you can get used to different working in different environments yeah i it's yeah i would totally agree i think everything you do is difficult at first yeah in life <laughs> like <laughs> generally yeah, yeah um but i also like okay here i'll give you some more hard hard advice here i think a good tactic if you can and if you it, especially when you first get to say, let's say you are freelancing and you are going into a company to freelance in their office. Mm -hmm. I would suggest trying to figure out a situation where you can be with the team. Right. A lot of times, and it's happened, you know, at several companies I've worked at, um, they put freelancers kind of on the outskirts of the team. Right. You know, like physically, like their desk is, farther away than the rest of the team right um and you know it definitely doesn't bode well for the freelancers morale like yeah it, you feel a little disconnected yeah um and so definitely if you had the chance like sit with the team and you know get to know them and get to work with them um and especially the companies listening like if you guys are listening to this try to incorporate the freelancers into your team. I know right. that I know that they are freelancers and that like hey they're just here for a quick amount of time, but you know, we're still humans. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and and as long as we're giving advice to to the clients and companies, also take your freelancers out to lunch on their first day. Yeah, that's I mean, too. that's just like, you know, common practice for like new hires, but yeah. It does make a freelancer feel more welcome, like if they are included in activities like lunch or coffee or anything like that. Yeah, like yeah, definitely like include the freelancers in activities and stuff. Yeah. I, now we're just speaking to our. Clients. I will. I'm we not do, gonna. Our, I'm, our clients do listen to this. I'm not gonna name names. Yeah. But I worked at this company once. I freelanced, mm -hmm. and I did not sit with the design team. I sat with like the strategy team. Okay. I sat far away from the industrial designers, but I also sat right next to the elevators. And every day, the industrial designers would get up, walk by my desk, clearly going to lunch, and not once did they extend the invite to go to lunch. And I am that I, that makes me cry, James. That was like I feel that, really sad. It was you. really upsetting. I, I really have give you to a say. Hug right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can hug afterward, but um, but yeah, I mean, it was like it was really disappointing. And I and I would say that at that place, I didn't ever really feel that welcome, and it was like it didn't make me feel great. And uh, and so, but I made I made the best of the situation, and when it was over, I I left. Yeah, I I honestly think. Again, like even that situation would have been solved if you were just sat in proximity to those people. Right. Like, I'm sure that they would have loved to invite you. They just didn't really know you because you didn't sit next to them. Yeah. Um, and I also will say, like, I think that's like the, at the beginning. Like, if you sit next to the team and you're like, you know, get to know them and everything, and then you want to like move or you want to work remote or like whatever it is. Yeah. It's just about that initial building up of the 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 relationship that I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing there was there was one thing about management styles which is which is an interesting point because oh, yeah. sometimes it doesn't you know process or management doesn't you know doesn't jive yeah. between you and your client and sometimes you just kind of have to set up like this is what I'm going to do like you hired me to execute this is how I'm going to execute. And 
I think that if the client is is a good client, they'll listen to you because they they clearly brought you in because they think that you're talented, right? And they think that you can execute. And so, like, sometimes you just kind of have to be like, "This is how I'm going to do this," and you know, just lay it out. And oftentimes, I think a client will be happy that the freelancer will come and say like this is this is the process that i'm going to do these are the deliverables this is when i'm going to deliver them and then that person doesn't have to worry about managing you they're managing a bunch of other people right they don't have to worry about like you know holding your hand that's a good that's a good tip too um yeah thanks for sending that in matt yeah um we had an anonymous question you want to read Ooh, this one James? yeah so the uh, anonymous question, I'll pull it up on my computer and I should have pulled it up for, for Matt's as well. Um, but the anonymous question is, I was wondering if either of you have been asked to rip off a product before. My firm declined a job that asked us to copy an existing product, but changed it slightly to prevent a patent infringement. Do you think this is a common occurrence? Is it morally right to take on a job like this? Woo! That's a that's a good question. It depends on on how much you need that job. <laughs> that, that's, uh, unfortunately, sometimes like people don't have the option. Like that's, that's true. They need a job. This is the job that they have. I think, yeah. I I, I will say that I have been in situations like this before. Um, I have never seen it in. I have never been in a situation where the client is literally like. Hey, here's this product. I want you to copy it, like, you know, fill verbatim. it, fill it for fill it. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> wait, wait, you can't just st- change it from circular to curvature continuous, <laughs> and then it's it's completely different. Um, it's much better. And I've never been in a situation where it's like fill it for fill it, but just tweak this one thing. Yeah, because because that to me is just like CAD monkey. Like mm. I'd be like, uh, that's not what I do. I design mm-hmm. products like if you want someone who can 3D model something, go on like Fiverr or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, but I have been in the situation where it's like, hey, there is this best-selling product on Amazon and we want to beat them, you know, with a competing product. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, can you somehow develop a product that, you know, is equivalent or better than this one? Mm-hmm. Um, which is actually pretty, like, that's really common yeah that's what everyone wants to do when they want to get the best-selling product and beat out the competition yeah um but that doesn't mean you have to copy them word or fill it for fill it what's the good we should start that fill it for fill it that is good i like that um and so i've always seen it as like a challenge like how can i design a product that's better than, right than than what's already being asked you know yeah yeah i think that's a good point i don't know that i've ever been asked to design something copy something fill it for fill it Mm -hmm. um i think yeah i've been in similar situations where it's like okay we have this thing we want to tweak this a little bit right and i mean the thing is is that sometimes when you're starting out you have to take those kind of crappy projects yeah no that's true you know on the other side of that it's also kind of a great learning experience for you if like you're not really comfortable in CAD or whatever. Like there, there's a skill set in there that you're not necessarily so comfortable with, and you have to go and somewhat replicate this other item. I mean, and if you're owning the CAD, you can make the tweaks to it to to make it more your own or For your, sure. you know. But there is some value in just having to recreate something or loosely recreate something. Uh, especially early on in your career, because it's a learning, it's a learning experience. Yeah, you definitely will get much better at your CAD software if yeah. you're like just trying to just copy something. I also think, just piggybacking off that a little bit, um, you are right in the sense that if you're recreating something, you have the power to like. Oh, by the way, I I added this extra thing on here because it makes the product so much better. You know, yeah. Like, you know, I added the whatever it is. You know, and now your product's even better than this one. It's not a copy plus, you know, tweaking. It's like a copy, but a better copy. Right. Um, and honestly, like that's 
that's all design is <laughs> <laughs> taking existing things and building on top of them like yeah it's it's like the the way i see this is like if a client ever came to you and asked you to copy something your first response would be like yes and not no i'm not going to copy it mm-hmm. it should be like oh we can definitely design this product but we can do it even better yeah the if a client is like such a stickler about like no, we just want an exact copy, then yeah, I, I don't think you should work with them. But yeah. I, I've rarely ever run into that situation before. It seems like such a weird situation. Yeah. And well, okay. And and maybe one other thought is that if somebody is asking you to copy something for a specific brand or, you know, uh, from a specific brand, it's likely because like either... Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe that brand is making that same object, but, uh, you know, increasing the price of it for some reason. Or those two items are not sold in the same stores. Like, they're they're sold in two separate places. And so, like, you know, they're just... They're, they're building... They're recreating that thing for a different brand because they're not sold in the same place. I don't know if that ever happens. But the other thing is, like... You know, this is the conundrum between like designers and carpenters. It's like a carpenter could recreate a shelf that's the standard shelf and not be said like, oh, like what is this total ripoff of every (laughs) other shelf that's ever been made? And it's like, you know, uh, to play to play an odd devil's advocate here. And maybe this is a dead end kind of talking point, but. I don't know. It is. It is kind of strange to me that there are certain there are certain careers where or, or certain you know, yeah, whatever. Like you can kind of do a certain level of copying, but it's not considered copying as much as it is in our world. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder why. I don't know. I think it's because patents. I think it's uh, probably patents and also just the artistic nature of industrial design. Hmm. Um, but who knows. That is a good question. I appreciate you sending that in. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I think I th- we got a shout out the week. Yes, we have a shout out. Um, of course, every week we like to give a shout out to someone who's doing something interesting. Uh, and because James has left Instagram, I have been taking charge. Um, this, sh- this shout out of the week is John Orion Young. Yes. Definitely, definitely a little bit different. Not a designer per se. Um, he is a VR artist, sculptor. And uses the artist, yeah, the artist, <laughs> and uses the program Medium, I believe, uh, probably some few other programs, to create these sculptures. Um, you know, kind of crazy, whimsical, funky uh, characters. It, it's really interesting stuff. Um, oh wow, he even does some animation. And the reason I I discovered him, I actually found out him a while back, but. He is in the VR museum, which I believe we've mentioned a couple times. Um, and I was just walking through one day, and I was like, "Whoa, this is this is crazy work." Yeah. Interesting enough, he sells his work via Bitcoin, via, huh. via blockchain. Um, so it's digital sculptures. You know, it's not a physical thing, but you can buy the digital sculpture on the blockchain. So you would own the right to that that uh, sculpture. Wow. Um, so that that's kind of interesting. Yeah, but check him out. Uh, I think he goes by Joy, kind of like as his has his acronym, but his handle is John Orion Young. Yeah, and we'll link to him. Really interesting work. Uses a lot of primary colors. Yes, it's so cool. It's um, so cool to look at. I mean, it, it's it's one of those moments where you're like, there's no bounds to the creativity of the human right. human mind. And we always like to like. Sometimes we like to shout out these like crazy things to like remind ourselves that we are in this small little bubble we call industrial design you know right and there's amazing work out there of all kinds of artists and inspiration be, can be taken from anywhere yeah um but yeah thanks for listening guys of course you can subscribe like comment uh rate everything uh youtube spotify apple Podcasts, google play that's right leave us a voicemail one six four six four nine four forty eleven. join the discord join that discord um kiyoshi the kid oh yeah gosh come have on we missed, have we missed shouting him out you didn't did we shout him out last episode i think we shouted him out our intro and outro is by kiyoshi the kid the amazing kiyoshi the kid oh my gosh um and as always i'm at nick p baker 
And I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out, guys. Later. <laughs>